punishment. You never want to accuse the Lord of laying burdens on you. Jeremiah chapter 23 makes it very clear that whatever we say, the burden that God put on us, the words that came out of our mouth, that's going to be our burden. And uh, that's the way it is. You want to be careful uh, of blaming God for placing burdens on you. In verse 34 of that 23rd chapter of Jeremiah, it tells us that whoever says the burden of the Lord, that the Lord will punish that person and his house. Now, that's not to say that the Lord will not punish us when we deserve it. The Lord's punishment is often designed to secure our obedience to him. Intelligent people are usually smart enough to figure out that when things aren't going well in our lives, we do a little self-analysis and and try to figure out what it is that we're doing that's displeasing to our Heavenly Father. Then we repent and then we do the best we can to do things His way. That's how you receive blessings in life, beloved. You want to leave the curses and that bad stuff to the other folks. When the Lord does punish us, we should kiss the paddle and say, thank you, Father. You know, it's written that he only chastises those that he loves. That's easily documented. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. How do we know what will bring punishment upon us? God's law tells us. The Lord is not going to make it to where he's going to punish us for something that he never told us. I don't want you doing that. He tells us in his law. We're going to begin our study today in Deuteronomy chapter 13, uh, verse 1. And we ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, Father. We ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Deuteronomy, the fifth and final book of Moses, chapter 13, verse 1, and it reads, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. Now, this is talking about a false prophet here. I don't want you to think that this is a prophet of God. We're talking about a dreamer, someone who dreams up things in his own head or her own head. We're gonna be talking about idolatry in this, this chapter. And you know, the, the worse the crime, the more severe the punishment in God's law. And, you know, we might say, well, you don't understand. We, we don't have idols today. Well, anything that you allow to come between you and your relationship with your heavenly father, you've made that an idol. I don't care if it's your house, uh, a fancy car, a boat, a motorcycle. If you allow it to come between the time that you spend with your heavenly father, it's an idol. Verse two. And the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, note the small g, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Let us worship the gods of the heathen or foreign lands, or make up our own religion, as you see today. Uh, people don't get around to teaching God's word. They got to come up with some other gambit to entertain their congregations uh, because they don't ever get around to teaching God's word. Verse three, thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you or tests you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You know, that's the purpose of this, the second earth and heaven age is to test his children. Are you going to be like a third of you were in the first earth age and follow Satan? Or are you going to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul? You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him, revere him, and keep his commandments and obey his voice 
and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. Check out this word cleave in your Strong's Concordance. It means joined together. And, and that's how your relationship with, should be with your heavenly father. You in him and he in you. And that prophet, the false prophet, or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. Severe crime, severe punishment. Any self-appointed prophets out there? Well, if you are, you might expect a little punishment in your future. Stick with God's word. Stay focused on God's word. Well, how do I know if this guy's a false prophet or a true prophet? Well, if what he says or she says is contrary to God's word, they're a false prophet. Allow the Holy Spirit to give you discernment when, when you're listening to other people, especially people who are profess to be a prophet or a preacher. There's a lot of false teaching out there. Because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage. It's your heavenly father that redeems you, not some false prophet or some sham God to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. Stay away from false teaching. Verse 6. And if thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is thine own soul, as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, small g again, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, coming up with some new religion. And you know, in Mark 13, uh, verse 12, it tells us that our relatives are going to be turning us in to the Antichrist when he's reigning here on earth. Expect it. But don't show favoritism to even a relative is what this is saying. Verse 7, namely of the gods of the people which are around about you, nigh unto thee or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. Not just the gods of the Canaanites and the land you're going into, the promised land, but the gods of all the other nations of the earth, from one end of the earth to the other. Verse 8, Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him. Don't show partiality or favoritism to your friends or relatives. If it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, it's wrong. But thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death as kinsman redeemer. And afterwards the, the, the hand of all the people. Now is that my words? No. That's God's word. Now don't take this though to think that you're to go out and pick up stones and stone someone to death. If you do that you're going to end up in jail. We are to obey the land, the laws of the land as Christians. So we can't take it upon ourselves. But that's what God thinks about idolatry. It's that serious. And if, if, if we had followed God's law in our civil law today, murderers, for example, what does God say to do with murderers? Put them to death. And people will see that you've done this and these things will cease, cease to, to happen among you. We don't, we don't do things God's way. And these things increase among us today. It's though they laugh, the criminals laugh at how long it takes for the system to punish them. I read, read the other day a guy that murdered people back in the 90s. They're just now getting around to executing him. That's, the, you know, I'm all for an appeals process, but I think it's gone too far. I think God would agree. Verse 10, 
and thou shalt stone him with stones that he die, because he has sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And all Israel shall hear and fear, revere again, and shall do no more any such wickedness as this among you, as this is among you. If thou shalt hear say in one of thy cities, which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, saying, now we switch gears here now, we're going to be not talking about an individual, but an entire city or town. Certain men, the children of Belial, Belial, men of Belial are worthless or, or godless, ungodly people, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known to follow a dreamer. Let's make up our own religion or worship the gods of the heathen. But in this case, they've drawn a whole town away from the Lord. Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently or sincerely. And behold, if it be truth and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you. And you want to make certain that it is true. Why? Because the punishment is very severe. Thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly and all that is therein and the cattle thereof uh, with the edge of the sword. It's though God put a ban on that town and nothing, everything in that town is accursed and nothing to be spared. And thou shalt gather all the spoil of it, the city, into the midst of the street thereof, and shall burn with fire the city, and all the spoil thereof every whit, for the Lord thy God, and it shall be in heap forever, it shall not be built again. Verse 17, and there shall cleave not of the cursed thing to thine hand, that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger, and show thee mercy and have compassion upon thee and multiply thee as he hath sworn unto thy fathers. God wants to bless his children that love and serve him. Uh, on the other hand, those who don't love and serve him and go whoring after other gods, uh, their life is cursed. Verse 18, when thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God to keep all his commandments, which I command thee this day, to do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord thy God. You know, that's something man, we, we're really good at doing what's good in our own eyes, within our own sight. Unfortunately, what's good in our sight and eyes is not always so good in the Lord's eyes. But the Holy Spirit, allow the Holy Spirit to give you discernment about what's right and what's wrong in your life. There will be no reward for evil men. Punishment is what they earn and it is punishment they will get. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 24 as we continue our study. Just after the book of Psalms, you've got a book by one of the wisest of all Solomon, Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 1. Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. You sure don't want to be with them after judgment day. You don't want to end up where the evil people end up. I couldn't help but think about Psalm 37, which is that acrostic psalm. In verses 7, 20, and 34 of Psalm 37, we learn that the wicked don't get ahead. They're going to go into the fire and be like the, the fat of a lamb on a, a fire, just up in smoke forever. And then in verse 34, those who are righteous will have front row seats when they go into the lake of fire. 
But you young folks, don't be envious of those who are wicked and evil, drug pushers, for example. Yeah, they've always got lots of money. They've always got nice cars and nice clothes, but they're gonna get what they've got coming to them. Uh, God looks upon drug pushers very negatively, verse two. For their heart, this is referring to the wicked and the evil, studieth destruction. In contrast to those of you who study God's word, the wicked study destruction and how to ruin others. And their lips talk of mischief. Through wisdom is an house builded. You could think of a house as your family. Through wisdom is a family builded or edified, strengthened. And by understanding it is established. And where do we find wisdom and understanding? All true wisdom comes from your heavenly father. He wrote this letter to you so that you can know what makes him happy. Don't allow Satan to move into your house. He, he will if you let him, believe me. And by knowledge shall the chambers or the, the, the rooms of your home be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Now, we're not necessarily talking about gold or silver as far as precious uh, and pleasant riches. Happiness, peace of mind, what is that worth to you? What, what is true peace of mind worth to you? Look around in the world today, beloved. People are lost. They are walking around like they're in a twilight zone, not knowing what tomorrow brings, why they haven't read the letter that God wrote to them. So uh, be thankful when you are, your home is blessed with happiness and peace of mind. There's a lot of unhappiness and despair in the world today. A wise man is strong. Yea, a man of knowledge increaseth strength. Knowledge is equal to strength and power. For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, spiritual war we are in today. And in, and in multitude of counselors there is safety. In multitude of wise counselors, there's security. Who do we have as counselors today? How about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, all the minor prophets are counselors that God sent to us. Be wise enough to listen to his counselors. Wisdom is too high for a fool. It's just out of his reach. A fool just never can quite reach wisdom. He openeth not his mouth in the gate. The gate at this time is where the courts were held. In other words, not able to make a decision or a wise judgment. He that deviseth or premeditates to do evil shall be called a mischievous person, a plotter or a con artist, you could think of this. The thought of foolishness is sin and the scorner is an abomination to men. Don't desire to be with them as it's stated in verse one. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Remember in verse five, what makes a man strong? Knowledge. Knowledge is equal to strength. Are you a hot house lily who's gonna faint at the first sign of adversity when Antichrist appears? No, you're gonna stand. You're gonna witness against the Antichrist and witness for the true Christ. Verse 10, right, we got that, verse 11. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain. This means that if you know something and someone's about to be put to death for a murder, and, the, and you know that they didn't commit it, you know somebody else did and you don't speak up, uh, that's what this is talking about. Verse 12, 
If thou sayest, behold, we knew it not. In other words, falsely say, I didn't know the, the truth in the matter. And you know what? A false witness is one of the six things that God's hate, that God hates. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 19. Doth not he that pondereth the heart or the mind consider it? And who is it that knows your heart and your mind? Of course, it's your heavenly father. Do you think he doesn't know the truth? And he, referring to the Lord, that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? Question. And shall not he render to every man according to his works? Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. We reap what we sow. Verse 13. My son, eat thou honey, because it is good, and the honeycomb which is sweet to the taste. We have an analogy throughout God's word that God's word is as sweet as honey. You remember in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 3. God himself appeared before Ezekiel. And he said, take this roll, the scroll, the word of God, in other words, and take it in your mouth. And it was sweet as honey. You know, I think that there'll be a day uh, in our future, in spiritual bodies, that we'll be able to take God's word and eat it and, and take it in to us. And then it'll be sweet as honey. I look forward to that day. The, the word of God never changes. It will always be. That's something you will never waste your time doing is studying God's word because heavens are going to change. The earth is going to change, but the word of God will never, ever change. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul. It tastes sweet as honey. When thou, hast, when thou hast found it, then there shall be a reward and thy expectation shall not be cut off. See, judgment day isn't necessarily a bad thing. It is a bad thing if you've been wicked and evil, but if you've taken the word of God into your mouth and experienced that taste as sweet as honey, then there is reward. Your expectation or your hope shall not be cut off. Lay not wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Spoil not his resting place. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. A, a good man might fall seven times, but he gets back up. And you know what? If you are righteous and you love God and you serve him, God will reach down with his hand and help you back up. That's, that's biblical. But on the other hand, a wicked will fall and be crushed by mischief, the first sign of mischief. He's not going to fall seven times and get back up. He's totally gone and wasted the first time uh, calamity or mischief comes his way. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Note the colon. The sentence doesn't end there. It continues in verse 18. Lest the Lord see it, and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Moffat translate this, that the Lord divert his wrath away from him and turn it on you, is what Moffat translates. Verse 19, fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. Remember back in verse 1, don't try and join them, separate yourself from them. Verse 20, for there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. How's your candle doing? Is your candle burning brightly with truth of the Lord to the world? I hope so. But for the wicked, there is no reward, only punishment. At the end of this dispensation, all will be recompensed according to their works. 
God doesn't show partiality or favoritism. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 7. And you know, a lot of people ask, well, you're Christians. Why do you study the Old Testament? Well, what we're about to read is prophecy of the future. And if you want to know what the future holds, then study the Old Testament because it tells us in many cases. Chapter 7, verse 1, as we continue our study concerning punishment. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Now this is the words of God through a true prophet, the prophet Ezekiel. Also, thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God unto the land of Israel, an end, the end is come upon the four corners of the land. Those four angels of Revelation chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7. They're holding back those four winds that will bring about the end of this dispensation. And that's what this chapter is talking about is the end of this dispensation. Now is the end come upon thee and I will send mine anger upon thee, the cup of God's wrath and will judge thee according to thy ways and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations. We get what we deserve, what we have earned. Could be rewards, it could be punishment. And mine eye, the Lord speaking, shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy ways upon thee, and thine abominations shall be in the midst of thee, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. You know, I'm glad God is the judge. Why? Because he's fair. He doesn't show favoritism to one of his children over another or partiality. We all get exactly what we deserve. Thus saith the Lord God, an evil and only evil behold is come. There is an evil one coming, all right, it's the Antichrist. An end is come, the end is come, it watcheth for thee, behold, it is come. Three times for emphasis. The morning is come unto thee. Well, what do we do in the morning? Hopefully we wake up. O oh, thou that dwellest in the land, the time is come. The day of trouble is near. The day of Jacob's trouble is near. And not the sounding again of the mountains. Many, when they realize that they have worshiped the Antichrist, will be praying for mountains to fall upon them. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now will I shortly pour out my fury upon them, on thee, and accomplish mine anger upon thee. And I will judge thee according to thy ways and will recompense thee for all thine abominations. Many, unfortunately, are going to be spiritually in bed with the abomination of desolation. And mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, no partiality, no favoritism. I will recompense thee according uh, to thy ways and thine abominations that are in the midst of thee. And ye shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. Behold the day, the Lord's day, when that seventh trump sounds. Behold, it has come, the morning is gone forth. The rod hath blossomed, pride hath budded. When Jesus returns at that seventh trump, He's not coming back as a babe in swaddling clothes this time. He's going to have that rod of correction in his hand. I say, come, Lord Jesus, come. That's the only way this mess is going to be straightened out, in my opinion. Violence is risen up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, nor of their multitude, nor of any of theirs. Neither shall there be wailing for them. The time has come, the day draweth near. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn. 
for wrath is upon uh, the, all the multitude thereof. And what this is talking about is the king of Babylon was coming at the time of Ezekiel. And what he's saying is buyers or sellers aren't gonna have time to rejoice in their purchase or the money they got for a sale because the king of Babylon is coming and he's gonna take everything anyway. The three sieges on Jerusalem. It's gonna be the same when the Antichrist comes. For the seller shall not return to that which is sold, although they were yet alive. For the vision is touching the whole multitude thereof, which shall not return, neither shall any strengthen himself in the iniquity of his life. Sin will not strengthen you. We learned in the last set of scripture we were in what strengthens you. It's knowledge and, and wisdom of God's word. They have blown the trumpet, the seventh trumpet, even to make all ready, but none goeth to the battle, for my wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. When that seventh trump sounds, they're not gonna be going to battle against the Antichrist, why? Because they're spiritually in bed with him, worshiping him. Again, many will be praying for mountains to fall upon them. The sword is without, and the pestilence and the famine, Amos chapter eight, verse 11, the famine for the end times is not for bread and water, but for hearing the word of God. The famine is on within. He that is in the field shall die with the sword. Revelation 1, 16, that two-edged sword, which is the tongue of Jesus Christ that cuts both ways. He that is in the city, famine and pestilence shall devour him. Song of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 25, talks about the same sword. Verse 16, but they that escape of them shall escape and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys, all of them mourning every one for his iniquity, for his sins. All hands shall be feeble and all knees shall be weak as water. They shall also gird themselves with sackcloth and horror shall cover them and shame shall be upon all faces and baldness upon all their heads. All of these are signs of mourning when they've worshiped, when they realize that they've worshiped the Antichrist, there will be a lot of mourning. They shall cast their silver in the streets and their gold shall be removed. They'll realize then that their money is worthless their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. You can't buy your salvation. It's not for sale. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity, of their sins. Christ himself is a stumbling block to many. Men and other powers may punish you or try to punish you, but there's only one that you should truly be concerned about punishing you. Turn with me to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 10, as we continue our study. Matthew chapter 10, let's pick it up with verse 16 the words of Jesus Christ. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And how do we become as wise as serpents? By studying God's word. Knowledge, wisdom is strength. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up in the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. You'll be delivered up before the synagogues of Satan of Revelation 2, 9 and Revelation 3, 9. And you shall be brought before the governors and the kings for my sake. Revelation chapter 13, verse one might come to mind. For a testimony against them and the Gentiles. The Gentiles, you could translate the nations of the world. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. 
for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. You know, a lot of people get uptight about the Antichrist. They have a lot of anxiety and they worry about what am I going to do when the Antichrist is here? You know, it's really pointless to worry about it. Why? You don't have to speak. You don't have to say a word. The Holy Spirit is going to speak through you. And you're not to premeditate what you say because that's the unforgivable sin, beloved. That's eternal. There is no forgiveness for that. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit, note the capital S, the Holy Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Fulfilling Joel chapter 2 verse 28. God said, I'll pour out my Spirit, the Holy Spirit, on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That's what Acts chapter 2 is talking about. It's not talking about speaking some gibberish or some unknown tongue. And everyone will understand no matter what language they speak. That's the same language that God's elect will speak when they're delivered up to the councils, the synagogue of Satan. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. We were talking about that in an earlier scripture. And the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Who is death? It's Satan. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. The reason Jesus came to earth in the flesh was to defeat he who has the power of death, that is to say, the devil. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. That's a good thing to be hated for. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. And oh, what a reward. A crown will be given to those who overcome. Don't let anyone take your crown. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye unto another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man uh, be come. And take strength from that. What this is saying is, you know, it's not going to last all that long. And we're told in Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 that you'll see tribulation uh, or, or adversity uh, 10 days. Verse 24. The disciple or the student is not above the master. Our master is Jesus Christ, nor the servant above his Lord. You know, they delivered up Christ and they crucified him. Uh, we're no better than he. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call him of his household? You know, they said that of Jesus. They said he cast out devils because he is of Beelzebub. Beelzebub means Lord of the flies or King of the dunghill. That is what they called Christ. Fear them not therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. We're ready for that spiritual war. Why? We have strength. By that, I'm not talking about physical strength. I'm talking about knowledge and wisdom of God's word. That is strength and power. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, truth. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Verse 28, the reason we came here. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And that, beloved, is only one entity. Your heavenly Father has that power. <coughs> Excuse me. The time in the flesh is a blink in the eye compared to the eternity. 
you know, should we be careful with our flesh bodies? Yeah, it would be foolish to be anything else. But is your flesh going to go into the eternity? No. Nope. Your flesh not going to go into the eternity. Your flesh has a date, unless the Lord returns first, in a grave. And that's where all of us are going to end up. So how important is that, is my point. The flesh is not important, beloved. You need to be concerned about he who has the power to destroy both your flesh and your soul in hell. That's the second death, the death of the soul. We talked about there briefly about not premeditating what we say. In closing, I want to turn to Mark chapter 3. There is one punishment that is eternal. The very next book in the Bible, Mark chapter 3. Let's pick it up with verse 22. And it reads, <clears throat> And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem, now we're talking about the, the muckety ducks from downtown Jerusalem, the hot shots, said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils cast he out devils, dangerous, accusing Christ of taking his power from Satan himself. You know, these same scribes couldn't cast out demons. They didn't have the power to cast out devils. Jesus Christ did. And he gave us that same power if we do it in his name. Verse 23. And he called them unto him, speak, Jesus speaking, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom, that's the king in his dominion, be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. It will surely fail. And if a house or a family be divided against itself, that house cannot stand stand. And you know, Satan loves nothing more than to see God's children fighting in their own homes. He laughs at us. Don't allow your family to be divided. Satan will beat you up. I'm here to tell you, he will take over your family. He will take over your home. If you let him, don't. Use the power that Jesus Christ gave you in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget that part. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. And what makes you a strong man or a woman. I hope you've got it by now. It's not physical strength. It's knowledge and wisdom of God's word gives you power and strength. Use the power and strength that Jesus Christ gave you over the one who would like to take your house. That's Satan. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But there is one blasphemy that is unforgivable. It follows. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Spirit hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. That is the unforgivable sin. If you commit that sin, the punishment is eternal. There is no forgiveness. Because they said he hath an unclean spirit. Again, saying that he uses the power of Beelzebub to cast out demons. There came then his brethren and his mother. And standing without sent unto him calling him. They're saying we better get out of here. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. They're, they're calling for you, Jesus. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? 
And he looked round about on them which sat about him, about him and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. In other words, all of them he looked upon as his family. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. Think about that. That's awesome. You and Jesus in the same family. How? Because you do the will of God. That's more important than your own self will, beloved. Punishment. God will use it to secure obedience. Uh, in the first example we used today, we saw today in Deuteronomy 13, it wasn't to secure the obedience of the idolater. The idolater was to be put to death, stoned to death. But it would secure the obedience of his other children when they saw these things happen and they would cease to happen. Let's go to his throne. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your written word, Father. Let everything that we do this week uh, be to the honor and glory of your name, Father. We ask a special blessing on this congregation, Father. Give us knowledge and wisdom, Father, which is strength, which is power, Father. And we'll exercise that in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.